Right. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I am actually going to send around a little poll uh, for everyone while we while we do introductions and while people to continue to come through. So feel free to to answer this, and and uh, I'll talk about the results in a little bit. Um, so you know, today's topic is broadly around uh, Gen AI and trying to understand a little bit about the the impact that Gen AI is making, can make, the challenges around it, but ultimately, how do we start to understand and evidence the impact it's making through data? Um, and I'm joined today by um, two folks who, who we work very closely with and have for a, a number of years. Um, and I'll let them introduce themselves in a second, but it's Max Baxter, Matt Baxter, otherwise known as Baxter, uh, who's a CTO at Caseware, um, and Stuart Pierce, who is one of the portfolio CTOs at HG Capital, who works across a broad set of companies, um, supporting them on their, on their Gen AI journeys. Um, so I'll, I'll hand over to you, Baxter, and then and to Stuart, uh, maybe just to do a simple introduction of yourselves, and then we'll, we'll get started. Yeah, so hey, Baxter from Caseware. Uh, for those not familiar, Caseware is a 35 plus year old company. And uh, I just joined six years ago to be able to help manage the engineering teams at Caseware. Uh, why the age is relevant is because Caseware has a bunch of very legacy desktop software, C++ code, uh, still running some like 30 plus year old, just very robust algorithms in there uh, through to the latest modern microservice Java, uh, Spring Boot type stuff in the cloud and even serverless in terms of the applications of Copilot across various code bases of different legacy. I think we have a pretty good mix as well as being a global company uh, in eight different countries that we have developers working away on the pure cloud stuff and then dozens of countries that are building on top of our low code, no code platform. Um, go ahead, Stuart. Uh, sure. So, so Stuart from HG Capital, uh, and for those not familiar, and HG is a private equity investor that specializes in predominantly B2B SaaS businesses. Um, so European and North American focus, um, we're now circa 50 companies in the portfolio coming up on 150 billion enterprise value, which taken in aggregate, um, would put us pretty close just behind SAP, I think, in terms of scale and, and reach. Um, and yeah, as Will kind of alluded to, my role is largely working with CTOs across the portfolio over the last year, an awful lot of focus on Gen AI, how we get value out of that. Excellent. Um, thank you both. So, you know, some early poll results. Um, interestingly, so about half of you have joined so far um, actually haven't started the Gen AI journey yet um, and are still exploring it. And then another 40% um, are still within the kind of early days phase. So within the first six months, still trying to, to roll it out, get to grasp of it. And so I think today's conversation will hopefully be very, very beneficial. Um, as we, you know, we're gonna host today as a very sort of casual round table conversation. So we've got a number of topics that, you know, we're, are gonna kind of structure our conversation, but the, at the end of the day, the conversation will go where the conversation goes. Um, and with that in mind, if there are any questions that you have, um, either you know topics we're covering, comments we're making, or if you want to ask Baxter or something specifically or Stuart specifically, just drop it in the Q and A box, and I'll I'll be monitoring that and uh, bring those through as and when I I can. So with that in mind, I think I'll start with Baxter. Tell us a little bit about Caseware's journey to date. Um, you know, what you guys are using, where you've rolled it out, just kind of high level um, where you guys are on your journey just to, to help shape the scene for everyone. So I would call us maybe early adopters in that we were pounding GitHub for when Copilot's available, then the enterprise version and the various aspects of it. Um, we had the advantage of having recently migrated all of uh, our global code bases to GitHub. So we already had the existing relationship and are already trusting GitHub and effectively Microsoft with all of our source code. And so that's a big barrier I get if you haven't already moved to a SaaS hosted source code model um, to be able to get to the point of trust and commercial relationship with someone and then security compliance, whoever needs to sign off, but we were already there. So that allowed us to turn on early. And so we've been full availability across all the developers for uh, about a 
almost a year now. I think it was last April or May that we uh, rolled it out for everyone. Um, and we've done starts and stops in terms of like pushing adoption on the different teams, um, following up with different groups in order to be able to share uh, lessons learned and what are the highest value use cases the different teams find. Uh, one of the challenges, which I'm sure people can appreciate is given the different languages, technology stacks, legacy levels, it's not like there's a one size fits all. Oh, just do this and it'll magically change everything. And so it, it hasn't been perfect, but it's certainly, we've seen very sustained usage and metrics across all of our development teams in virtually every area, um, all the way back to the C++ desktop software teams, uh, which I personally find kind of cool to see that at, when you think about the code bases that it was likely trained on, I don't know how many legacy desktop code bases were actually in the training data set, but the developers are able to get value from it. And I, I guess, Stuart, one, one for you is, as you think about the journey that you've been on previously, and as you're working with a lot of the companies that you're advising, how, where do you see the, the greatest potential um, to unlock value for in using in Gen AI? Um, so, so I think probably by far the biggest lift for a software investor is in terms of how do you leverage that in a you know, customer value creating feature kind of manner. Um, that's pretty pretty difficult and it needs a lot of in-depth understanding. So our early focus has been on saying actually in the near term, it's much easier to unlock efficiency, effectiveness, gains, um, you know, if you, if you look at the kind of price point of the tooling, it's probably fair to say every product development group at any software business is always under pressure to deliver more, faster, cheaper. Um, and therefore, any kind of productivity gain that you can get from this technology is going to help you deliver against that. Um, yeah, c current pricing, break even is somewhere below 1% productivity is what you need to believe in in terms of getting back your investment in the tooling. Um, so for us, it's a question of saying, if we focus first of all on how do we enable our teams to be able to use the technology and get benefit from it, that also, as Baxter and I have discussed in the past, kind of enables you to train your engineers and think about, well, if we were to use this technology and build features for our customers, what kind of things would deliver value to the customer base? I guess on that point, in, in slightly touching on something you mentioned, Baxter, with your rollout, where when you when you first started rolling out um, Gen AI at K Square, how did you approach it in terms of different technologies, different languages, different seniorities? Where, where was the starting point for you guys? Uh, we opened up for experimentation, okay. and then we just said everyone has a license have at it to a degree, uh, go play with it as an interesting management data point of who is an innovator really to be able to play around with that new tech. There's an underlying assumption that almost everyone has played with ChatGPT. And so you're familiar with its ability to be able to generate human sounding text, pass Turing tests in a bunch of cases. And so you theoretically, like just intuitively should be able to apply that in some other context in order to get a result. And then it's saying, hey, I build technology for a living. Um, probably should play around with tech. Uh, and so fascinating auxiliary stuff around the introduction of it. Surprising, I guess, over half the development group didn't touch it until we did more prompting to say, like literally have told the teams, like it, it doesn't matter if you want to try it or not, you basically need to try this at some point in the relatively near future, because I personally believe that this will be a required tool set like Google search became 20 odd years ago. Before the internet, you had to read books in order to figure out what you needed to code. And then the internet came along and all the searching and now everyone just stack overflows everything and you cut and paste code. And frankly, I think that's the alternative that most developers fall back on for efficiency is they're just Googling, sorting results, finding the code, starting with that, or cutting and pasting code from other company resources as opposed to leveraging the copilot because almost nothing is written bespoke anymore and it would be a waste of time to do so. You're using templates in order to get somewhere. Um, and so by pushing and saying, look, this is where Gen AI is today and Copilot is today, but this is what's actually going to be moving forward in the future in terms of getting more accurate, more predictive. And by understanding the user experience around it, the interface around it, and how you interact with this technology to be able to 
do your job more effectively and efficiently, at least the coding part of it, the more successful you will be at your chosen craft. And like try into the career aspirations or goals or like just trying to do the job more effectively, got adoption up. The other really interesting thing was given that we build vertical market software for primarily accountants, insurance, internal audit and things, we were also introducing our own Gen AI to this profession that we service. And it was imperative to be able to remind developers that your experience with Gen AI as an add-on to your IDE, to how you do your work is actually very similar to the adoption cycle that our users that we build technology for are experiencing as we give them Gen AI tools. Because guess what? It isn't right all the time. It does hallucinate. You do have to carefully review all the content it provides, but you know what? When it does a couple of the use cases really, really slickly and saves you a bunch of time, you do get that wow feeling like you would have maybe from a chat GPT generating a nice greeting card or thank you message or something that people have tried. And it's that kind of thing helped. And then the other thing I'll mention to this group, which is kind of, if you aren't paying attention yet, you might want to. I was very surprised that we were able to pick up some very high skilled developer talent. And one of the comments of why were you looking and why did you join Caseware is because your current company doesn't allow you to use Copilot or a similar tool to do your job. And they felt like that was a canary my company is not an innovator. They're restricting my ability to be able to experiment with new tech. And therefore, I'm actually going to make an employment decision based on whether the technology is available for me to be able to use to do my job to the best of my ability and actually stay on top of the technology, which that in nowhere of our decision matrix of adopting the tool and pushing and everything else was that a checkbox. But after obviously being able to pick up tech talent and employer brand, because it was like, I guess that makes sense. Sure, we'll take it. Just as a caution, if it's still like a restriction for you, probably want to get it unblocked. So at least the people that are really eager to use it, have it available to them in order to be able to leverage it um, because it it can be a differentiator, that's all. So that was probably a lot broader than you were looking for, Will, on that one. <laughs> oh, we're, we're unpack that. Um, <laughs> but the one of the early things that you, you mentioned, obviously you had, it sounded like you've got a, about half of your engineering teams were naturally inclined to start playing around with it. The other half, maybe wasn't so naturally inclined. What what were the general reasons behind that? What did you have to change to, to get them more involved? Did you have to structure it around particular use cases? How how did you get that remaining 50%? And what was kind of, what do you think was actually driving that? Was it just people being preoccupied? Was it there a sort of natural hesitation towards it, a cynicism towards it? And I assume it's the technology adoption curve we're all familiar with building technologists. And it's the fact that human nature, I can get the job done just fine with all the tools that I know how to use really efficiently. And I have to figure out how to enable this new ID plugin or like ask a question and figure out how to parse that response. Well, that, that's that much incremental more effort that what's in it for me. And when it gets down to it, I don't, I, in a bunch of cases, I'm sure, I don't really trust the result anyways. And I'm, I'm worried that it's gonna give me something that I think is correct that I'll be held accountable for. And that was from certainly the junior like student intern co-op developers was loud and clear. They were very worried that they were it was gonna generate hundreds of lines of code that they would have no idea how to interpret or parse due to their experience level. And they felt much more comfortable doing much more incremental. I'm writing a block of code. I'm potentially cutting and pasting a block of code and editing it, but it's from a much more known source. And then when a senior asked me, why did you do this thing? I'm gonna have a lot better discussion around it than if I had just dumped a whole bunch of generated code, um, which again, just interesting human nature around adoption and the the actual things we did to push it. The highest value thing was having the, the high adopters demo what they did, especially around unit testing. It's kind of one of those nice, as long as your code has been constructed in a nice encapsulated way that you can actually write unit tests, which isn't always the case, but when it is, and you tell a copilot to go and generate your unit test, it's like, bam, not perfect, but close enough that it saves you hours of time if you knew what you, the task to go and generate all those unit tests were to be able to quickly uh, get through it. But I understand if you haven't done the work to be an expert at generating the unit tests or constructing the code to be unit testable yet, then it, it does create a bunch of hurdles that someone has to get through before they can see the inherent value of doing even that task. But by having ideally the senior people, the people look up to is like, oh, wow, that's what I aspire to be like, be able to demo it and show how easy the UX is because the embedded IDE stuff really is well done in order to be able to get more people to play with it was a big driving factor on it. Okay. And did you see, 
Is there a consolidated set of use cases at the outset? I, I'm interested in, in Stuart, your view on this as well and what you're seeing across other teams. Um, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A as well, which I want to get to, because I think one in particular is, is related to what we're talking about here. But before jumping into those, I guess your your views, because I think a lot of a lot of what we expect to see kind of behaviorally, whether it's right or it's wrong, and ultimately in the data is going to be predicated very much on the use case. So talking about that, Baxter, and what you're looking at in terms of you know the, the initial use cases that were driving behavior in your organization, and Stuart, what you're seeing broadly with the companies that you're with, be interested in, in sharing that. Do you want to go first, Stuart? Sure. So, so look, I, I think the, the adoption piece that you speak to absolutely is the majority case. Um, when, when I talk across the portfolio, most teams are kind of netting out at being broadly 70% adoption is where they seem to be landing early on organically. Um, the, the really interesting piece I've found is when, when you go and talk to the 30% who aren't using it, particularly the, the ones who started and then backed away, you, you get to some really interesting conversations very often about, well, in our team, we have this unusual workflow that forces certain behaviors and the tool just doesn't work well with that. Or we follow these design patterns, use this particular technology and the tool hurts me more than it helps me. Um, it's, it's proven a really good way at surfacing well, why do we do this weird thing? Because, you know, there are lots of industry standard architectural patterns that you could use and the tool works really well with those. Um, maybe it made sense 15, 20 years ago when that code was written, um, but it, it's really shining a spotlight on pieces of technical debt that have been dragging on the org but just weren't realized for a long time, um, which is, is valuable in its own right. Um, and, and then the rest of it does kind of come to you play to the strengths of the tools and unit testing is a massive strength. Documentation is pretty strong. All, all, all things that I would normally kind of hoover up as being some form of boilerplate mechanical process. Um, yeah, CRUD APIs, there's, there's a lot of work there, but beyond a, a small number of design decisions you make early on, there, there's not a huge amount of thought process and decision has to go into it. Yeah, if you're following mainstream design patterns with mainstream languages, then the, the tools are really good at helping you accelerate in those kind of cases. Okay, Baxter, do you think you wanted to add into that? Uh, just that I would add that bounded context is critically important to the context windows that the tool operates in. So yeah. even in say our newer services that I like to think are better architected, more standard practices, it still struggles as soon as you get beyond a certain scale to reach the right result. I was hopeful that maybe we could point it to some legacy stuff and tell it to refactor it, to even like make it unit testable by proper, proper encapsulation. But it it almost infallibly gets it fundamentally wrong in terms of the business logic. So when you tell it to uh, rewrite or stuff, like it introduces subtle bugs that are probably make it worse than if you didn't use the tool on some of those cases in our experimentation is what we found. Probably to Stuart's point, well, it would be great if you'd written it right the first time. It'd be great if Gen AI would be able to help you to be able to better refactor, but it's not there yet, but I stand by it will get there. Like this, this is the future of the technology horizon that is going to be rapidly evolving and eventually is going to be possible. And at least on our side, we will continue to push our vendors to be able to provide us with bigger context windows, more intelligent searching. The only thing that we have not signed off on is the ability to use all the public repos as a part of the co-pilot because if you do that then microsoft's not going to back you on any lawsuits related to the usage kind of a idiosyncrasy problem but other than that we're definitely looking to be early adopters of anything we can there in order to make it so we can have broader context windows but it's also providing that message to the teams to not just binary throw it out because it didn't work for a use case ask them why do you think it didn't work and like, think about what was the prompt that you gave it? Because there was prompt engineering and the more you use it, the better your prompts get in order to be able to get better results. Definitely makes a big difference. But even when you can't with 10 iterations figure out a prompt that actually gets you a result, it's fair to then say, what is the current limitations of the Gen AI doing its best to be able to provide you with a solution that is preventing it? And it helps developers to think more deeply around the computer science problem that's underlying 
the ability to be able to provide a good response that I think helps scale to how we're going to be able to leverage these types of technologies in our own products, because we do also want to build our own expertise in this in terms of understanding it, because we do believe it's going to be a meaningful game changer in the technology horizon we provide to our chosen professions that we serve as tech as well. And it's reinforcing that message of like, even if you use it for a couple hours a week and you're not even actually, you feel like it's making you more efficient, it's actually kind of important to be more successful at the broader mission of what we're trying to accomplish as well. And it, in terms of like the, the use cases, that's what I mentioned. It depends on the code base. It depends on the language and then the architecture pattern to say, what is the use cases that actually work in this case? The other one actually I mentioned is documentation. In general, if you pointed at a bunch of code and then you tell it, hey, generate some documentation, and tell me some context around this, it does a good enough job and people definitely don't expect precision necessarily. And so that's another good one to get people to be like, oh, okay, yeah, uh, if I'm having trouble understanding some logic here, I can definitely point it at uh, regex. Great example of that. <laughs> Parse out the nuances of a complicated regex statement or something like that is a good one. One of the one of the things that I'm I'm particularly interested in is the application of use of Gen AI in certain cases, let's say unit testing, right? It, it implies a certain outcome around quality, right? There are two things which I think are very interesting from, from what I've seen in conversations and in the data, which doesn't necessarily deliver on those expected outcomes, partially because you talk a little bit, I'm not into to you, Baxter, a little bit about the subtle bugs concept, but it, I think one thing that I've seen is it the application and use of it changes the fundamental fundamental roles and that that engineers need to play throughout the review process, right? And in doing so, sometimes that it can be applied more effectively than other times where subtle bugs may or may not slip through a particular process. So the ultimate outcome of achieving better quality may or may not be realized until people can recognize that the application of this helps you to optimize one part of the process, but it does assume that you're gonna play a slightly different role in a different part of the process. So I'd be interested in seeing or hearing your opinions and what you're seeing in relation to, A, are you starting to see some of those outcomes achieved at a micro level? Not, not the big ones in terms of ultimately, are we producing more for less money? But even just at the smaller level, are you starting to see those outcomes? And are teams recognizing the role responsibility, the shift in role responsibility that they played to be able to maybe you know, focus more on prompting as opposed to uh, the actual code as aspect of things and perfecting that art, but also afterwards in terms of the code review and being able to scour and find those subtle bugs or not doing so and therefore seeing that you have potentially a, um, a quality issue. Very long-winded question. <laughs> and in our case, we didn't see attributable quality differences related to the Copilot usage or adoption. I, there was a really good paper published recently around code quality general decline because of uh, Gen AI code. Um, I do intuitively, it kind of makes sense that if you don't have the right review mechanisms around it, then it would allow you to generate a bunch more code without reviews. Um, one data point we have is that it's much more commonly used by developers in a language they're not familiar with. So when we ask desktop devs to write some cloud code, there's a lot more Gen AI code going in there. And similarly with the cloud developers when they're using a less frequently like front end working on back end, uh, noting that it's not their normal day-to-day -day language. That's where we see higher usage. And in that case, it would be nice if there was better uh, highlighting as a part of the workflow of this is gener generated code. So the reviewers could probably flag it for extra review, but at the same time, maybe you should just test your system and do good reviews all the time anyways, in order to maintain cool quality. And then on the testing, the test teams are using it in order to be able to um, it's in combination, which is interesting because we're also leveraging Atlassian has their full AI suite that's just included in a lot of licensing programs. If you have that in order to say, generate test cases, extra descriptions, trying to think about edge cases, which is, I would say as useful or more useful in the actual automation of the code than being generated to be able to automate that. And because we're doing heavy investment in QA automation, as I imagine most people are, that's where it's hard to do attribution at a micro level of, oh, Copilot obviously is this effect because in general we see shifting left on testing due to like a lot of application and then watching closely for the can Gen AI help us to get more test cases automated with the same number of people or not. And we haven't seen a super, super measurable percentage, honestly, in terms of saying, oh, well, we thought it would take 10 testers a year to do all this. Now it's going to take five or something like that. Um, but 
maybe some other organizations have had better success with it. I guess personally, I'm a little bit surprised you can't see more value from it because you have a well-documented test case. I think you should be able to translate that to um, the actual code that would validate the test case, but then it gets down to, I think, context windows sizing um, and its ability to be able to understand everything that's required in order to be able to properly test a function. Stuart, anything you'd throw in there as well? Yeah, I mean, if I kind of go back to your original quality question, I think the, the other dynamics I see happening, um, so, so the first one is you, you've got a lot of individual contributor engineers who are now often for the first time having to review the work of others. You know, they're, they're effectively receiving work from a third party that they've got to think about the quality. Uh, and that's new to a lot of the junior guys. Um, but in terms of a prompts best setting as well, but particularly when they're going beyond the inline prompting of Copilot and they're starting to work with rag tools and APIs directly, that, that there's a bit of a mindset shift of you're, you're likely to get materially better results if you set the model a series of objectives and outcomes rather than specific tasks. But you need to think about a problem you're solving differently. And again, th these are kind of soft skills that folks who've gone up through a management track have generally been trained on or picked up on, but it doesn't necessarily come through in the lower levels of the org. So a lot of the ICs struggle with that, I think, in the early phases, mm -hmm. but they get worse results and they, they maybe back away from it all a little bit. But... This may be related to a question uh, Ben asks. Um, so it, it, they've rolled out Copilot to a, a fairly large cohort of engineers really one for both of you, either of you, if you want to answer this, but how do you maintain engagement from the engineering teams? You know, assuming that using these tools wax and wanes a little bit, and also how do you measure that engineers are actually using Copilot effectively for prompts? I'm not sure I've got a great answer for that yet. I mean, I don't think, I don't, I, sorry. Let me rephrase. I don't think anybody has a great answer for specifically that, but what, what are your thoughts on sort of how you would approach it? Because I, I think one thing that you're talking about in terms of outcome led, right? What are the, you know, focusing on the outcome you're trying to drive can be one way of approaching it. Uh, um, I don't know. That's why so, I raised it that point. Yeah. Um, my general approach to that one is I make the assumption that everyone's trying to do the best job they can and with as little effort as possible, get the job done. Meaning if something is clearly going to be more efficient to get the job done, they're going to use it. I, that's my assumption, especially developers, uh, engineers, like trained to be able to look for efficiency. Uh, it's kind of stereotyped in our personalities in terms of why we do what we do and why we love what we do. Um, and so if Copilot really was this like silver bullet of efficiency, I don't think you'd have laggards in adoption. Like I, I haven't run into a single person that said, I'm worried about it taking my job or I don't want to use it because it's going to be, be too efficient. Like this, it's not even part of the mental model in it. And then it's around the questions of, well, why don't you think it's as efficient as the other stuff that you know to do really well? And I do think it's the efficiency of knowing where in the code base to cut and paste stuff from and Googling and knowing how to very quickly find that stack overflow or alternate source type answer or, um, it, interface to the latest AWS or Azure service and stuff like that. And one of the things we did notice in our user testing is that due to the nature of the training, I think when you ask it to say, give me an implementation for an S3 bucket with this particular parameters to solve this use case, it will give you an implementation, but it's not necessarily the most up-to-date version that if you went to Amazon's documentation and said, hey, how do I do an implementation? It's actually potentially a version or two before. And that's kind of a, a breaker for people when they're like, well, why would I want an old implementation when a Google's going to give me more relevant result that really is seems like it's just fast to go and cut and paste that. Very good UX around Amazon's documentation to be able to put in an interface. And that's where I go back to it agreed that it's not a perfect silver bullet today. However, it is critical and it is going to be the one that gets much better than the search through platform documentation that's available and those platforms are actively working to try and make it better. So it might be a year, maybe a couple of years, but maybe a few months, but very soon, this is definitely going to be the most efficient way. And so you should get good at the UX and try it and get good at the prompt engineering as a nudge people to do it, even though it's not making them fundamentally more efficient. Um, 
but is it okay if I touch on the other anonymous attendee question around efficiency as well? Because yeah. that gonna gets into the, yeah. we've heard about the stories of great efficiency. And I will say for proof of concept use cases or MVP products, it is a 10X tool. If you have like any interview questions is a great example. It, every interview question has to be bound in context for someone to be able to answer an hour or two. Even a take-home exam has to be done within a couple of days, um, within probably hopefully a few hours. You're not giving people 20 hours worth of work. And so by design, you've bounded the context to something that Gen AI is really, really good at. And so if you want to spin up a marketing demo, it is phenomenal at making it so much faster in order to wrap a prototype and throw something in the wall and see what sticks and get it looking good enough to be able to market. When you get into a robust aspect of a very large complex domain service, that's where it starts to fall down. I think just primarily due to context windows, the ability to be able to aggregate all that state in a meaningful way to be able to get to the results. And so you have to be very careful around extrapolating from the efficiency gains at the small bounded context problem set, which is very few companies are lucky enough to operate in that sphere. I feel like most of us are in the unfortunate, much more complex, expensive, very hard to manage, but we sell products and make a premium and have nice to keep markets because of it. So there's other advantages, but it's very, very different in terms of potential efficiencies. Um, but if it's a little bit of a to it sword encouraging developers to try interview questions um, because that can have negative outcomes of people doing much better in interviews for other positions or anything, but it is a way to be able to get people to get the aha, like, oh, no, 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 I can see how this is the future because it can do this thing incredibly well, better than a human in a much shorter amount of time, like our experiences probably with ChatGPT and others. Um, in terms of some of the really cool stuff that it does, it would just, it'd be nice if it was more predictable and worked at a bigger scale, that's all. Yeah. And on those interview questions, Baxter, I, I've certainly noticed some of the online services that we've historically used across the portfolio for, for remote interviews. You could see not long after GPT went mainstream and certainly when Copilot took its last upgrade, massive upticks in the pass rate. Um, because e even if you don't copy paste the whole question in, just starting to type the question, often it's written a perfect answer before you get to the end of the, the question. And it, it would be nice if you translate that level of efficiency anywhere else. We just haven't been able to crack that one yet. So, so I'm going to combine a couple of questions here into another point, which is, and this is, I'll, I'll point at Stuart because it's an incredibly unfair question to point at Stuart, um, which is, is it possible very quickly to implement Gen AI and see a 10x return on productivity at, at a 5x cut of the cost, as is as is often spouted as the, the miracle um, of value to be achieved in the first week? And if not, where in your mind you know what are the what are the success criteria that you start to think about in terms of where to to think about measurement right whether it's human adoption cultural shift actual impact in the data itself where are you looking what are the kpis that you start to think about to help you measure success which you know i guess the real question here is how do you measure success in the early adoption phase and what what kind of you know metrics or, or data points are you looking at to help you get a good sense of you know where the teams are on that journey assuming that they're not going to not going to achieve the the marketing material promise on day one yeah i mean maybe if you have a incredibly well structured and broken down microservice architecture that fits the context window perfectly you might get close i've not seen anyone that's close to that um so certainly when I'm setting expectations with our investment teams, you know, we, we kind of look at it and say end to end, it probably nets out a 10 to 20% lift um, of that kind of range because writing code is just one component of a much bigger end to end process. Mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of measurements, you, you can get some fairly good indicators quite quickly around let's call them activity, if, if you think in terms of space framework. So numbers of PRs, lines of code, um, size of PR complexity, those kind of things. Um, but when you start to then say, okay, what, what's my 
cycle time Get, getting to production what's my actual throughput from a end-to-end -end product management point of view and customer responsiveness yep. those are much slower to change they're exposed to everything that feeds into normal good ci cd devops practices um and you see a lot of correlation of the folks that were already really agile are clearly able to exploit and get more out of the tools than the ones where, for various reasons, you, you've got some form of batching or something that's slowing down that process naturally elsewhere. Um, but there is a degree of kind of the people that were really well enabled from a DevOps point of view, at least in the initial phase, pull away. Um, I, I do see if these tools are pretty good at helping teams slow down the rate of accruing technical debt and start to burn down the backlog. So, so you know, there's not many people track it, but the folks who do track, let's call it trailing technical debt, where something falls short of your definition of done, but you let it go anyway and you put tasks in the next sprint, you see less of that because it's easy to have the tool help you write all of the unit tests, to write the documentation and so on it helps you burn through a backlog quicker if you're trying to drive up your test automation and the things that help enable you on that path towards continuous delivery. Um, <clears throat> but you are still fundamentally coming from behind. So there's a, there's a kind of catch up period there. Thanks, um, you'd share on that? No, but I immediately want to figure out how I can measure my trailing technical debt to be able to see if we might be missing a metric here because <laughs> we're not currently measuring it. It's a great one. I know, um, a, I know a tool for that now. Um. <laughs> and we do cycle times uh, to be able to track. And again, our challenge that we haven't been able to find an attributable uh, metric around development team efficiency. So we go back to the usage metrics. Uh, the amount of lines of code that get actually accepted by the teams is kind of a trend line on an incline. Um, the actual usage. Um, it, it's interesting, actually, uh, maybe it's human nature, but we see much, much higher acceptance rates on weekends than we do during the week. And so when developers, whether it's a side project or additional work that they decide to pick up or it's a Saturday morning, you're like, screw it. I'm just going to accept changes. I don't know. <laughs> if only you knew the trailing debt, you probably could have an answer to that question. <laughs> see if it's tied to that trend. But like, those are the kind of interesting anecdotes that show up that it's like, huh, that's really interesting. There's probably something there that we should dig into. Um, but in turn, it is good to see that people are using it more and more on it, uh, on an incline, not like a hockey stick by any means. And when we look at though, the individual team metrics, we say, so, did we get a lot more done than we thought we were going to get done? The answer right now is no. We don't see any great uptick and trying to do correlations of usage to particular squads on teams that are building that are actually using it more versus others and maybe testing that. I haven't seen anything uh, super compelling. Like you, you can cherry pick examples all day long. I can give you examples that make it look great or make it look terrible. And to me, that indicates that it's just another tool that people are using to get the job done due to the nature of the actual writing of code only being such a small overall percentage of the time that's going in that even if it does make it that much more efficient it's not that much more but the biggest limit test for me is that people not everyone is using it as part of their daily job every day if it was that much of an efficiency gain i honestly think they would be because people generally want to get the work done and want to do their best and build the best tech that they possibly can so um I, I think it's on the edge of providing that real efficiency gain to enterprise software. It's just not quite there yet, is my think, personal feeling on it. Based on the metrics that we've been tracking, we'll continue to track. And I think, and I think part of that is is you know, the incentive to work more efficiently is evident, but the ability to achieve efficiency always relies on somebody to get out of the ways that they think is efficient, i.e., googling for code versus using something like this and putting in the energy into prompt engineering so that ultimately they become, you know, that that's a stubborn human trait. I think slightly in line with one of the points that you mentioned, it, you know, whether it's because of, I, mean, I think it is broadly because of, of the popularity of chat GPT and how that's hit headlines in, in every context. There's, there's, there's a lot of awareness, familiarity with Gen AI, the potential impact, you know, obviously Microsoft, GitHub has done a lot of marketing material that's hit every, every, every area of your business function. 
I think it's it's safe to say it is varied the ways that you can start to think about and measure the impact. And a lot of that's gonna be very use, use case determined. With the folks that you work with at the board level or, or outside of that, you know, a, a fundamentally non-technical audience that has heard a lot of promise in terms of the value that can be created from the use and adoption of this tool. How do you how do you manage these conversations, right? How do you manage the hype that's being expressed around that with, you know, sort of also at the same time bringing an engineering function on a journey to be able to change those patterns of behavior and hopefully kind of drive better efficiency or better use of these tools. How do you manage the kind of expectation versus reality of, you know, being on that Gen AI, Gen AI journey versus the expectation of being able to show a return straight away? Or do you? So if it's serious to me, I guess, thankfully, it, it comes up as a very regular discussion topic because it huge marketing um but it at the same time there's healthy skepticism i want to say but I, I i don't feel like i'm being given unrealistically uh high expectations around connectivity to it um a little bit is getting into our product and our market and our value quantification of exactly what the value is being provided to the practitioners that are leveraging our technology we're also working on the maturity there and so it's like, we are the experts of this space. We are the, in a bunch of markets, the de facto standard for what we do. And if we haven't done really, really detailed, good quantification of it, like it's kind of a fair corollary to the development team's org's ability to be able to prove real efficiency. It's about finding these use cases at this point, given the maturity of the technology, and then know that we are, we're investing in it. We're going to get there. We're measuring it. At the end of the day, we're just trying to build that product roadmap as efficiently as possible. If we could do it for 10% less, of course we would, or we build 10% more. And so here's all the stuff we're doing around the actioning of it. But if you want to get down into, okay, let's talk about the actual tasks, whatever. We've got the recorded demos of all the use cases, demoing the positives and the negatives of some of the challenges that people were into to be able to explain. Great here, in this case, with this bounded context, actually risky here potentially introduces these latent bugs that nobody would want that we have to spend more to be able to catch up. But here's the balance that we will continue to navigate because it is the future we will continue to invest in it. That's generally when we want to go deep in the conversation, that's what we're talking about. It's never a hit you over the head. Hey, we're taking 10% off your budget because you should be able to do more with less with the latest tech or anything like that, that I have to deal with anyways. Stuart, as somebody who tries to manage expectations broadly, what's your, uh, what's your experience, your advice in this side of things? Uh, that we should take 10% out of Baxter's budget. Uh, um, no. <laughs> so, um, Sorry. The, <laughs> Sorry, Baxter. It, it, it starts with that education piece of writing code is one part in the wider end-to-end -end process. So kind of reminding everybody of that part of the machine may have sped up, but it still has to operate within this wider end-to-end -end process. Um, and, and then it's really calling on all the different data points we've been able to gather across the portfolio over the last year, looking at how that kind of correlates. Um, we're quite fortunate that one of the portfolio companies is big enough, they were able to run true A-B test. So, so the org's big enough where you could say, okay, here are two teams that are working on the same code base, doing the same kind of work uh, at the same time. One team has co-pilot, one team does not. Um, and their productivity stats that were coming out of JIRA uh, and elsewhere, they did back up the kind of 10 to 20% boost. It's a rare organization that has that kind of scale where you've got enough people to be running parallel teams and a, a really comparable test. Um, but no, we're, we're very much focusing then around, okay, how, how do you target where you use this? Because if you're trying to use it on design spikes and so on, you're probably not going to get very much lift. If on the other hand, you're actively knocking down pieces of tech debt and things that you already know are hurting your cycle time, attribution is really hard of how much of that are you going to attribute to the AI tool versus the fact that you killed a piece of tech debt that you could have gone and worked on at any time. Mm -hmm. But the end result is the same, that you've now unlocked that kind of virtuous circle of flywheel effect for the org and it can go faster because it's no longer carrying the drag of that tech debt. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up the last question, I think. There's actually a few more I'd like to get into, but um, it is technically time at the moment. Um, if you gentlemen are, are around for a few minutes, maybe um, to answer this one. It's a two-point question here from Ray, and I think the, the first one um, is an interesting question. I don't know if you have um, exposure to this yet, but have you seen any sort of differences in strengths between different tool sets and different applications? Um, and then I, I think the second part of that is you know, we focused a lot on Gen AI's application in the world of, of coding and unit testing. Have you guys seen anything so far, the application of it in the PDLC or other elements of the SDLC, which has had an interesting impact? And it's a little bit outside of the realm of what we've been just discussing today, but I think it's it's a great question around maybe not, you know, generating test data we've talked about a little bit, but I'm interesting for sure, generating designs, deployment, any other aspects of the SDLC or even above. I mean, I, I can kick off and in, in terms of models and tools, um, we, we've we run a number of side-by-sides, Copilot, Code Whisperer, directly using um, GPT and the, the different versions of models. Um, I think it's probably fair to say if you drive GPT-4 Turbo directly through the API uh, with, with a kind of rag pattern, then there is a material jump up in the quality of what you get back. And it does let you take on some of those bigger context tasks because it has a bigger context window. But from a user experience and developer enablement point of view, it's quite a bit more painful to work with. You're no longer in the IDE. You now you've got custom scripting. You've got a lot more complexity going off. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a trade-off as to, to where do you, yeah, where, where is it worth that overhead for, for the kind of bulk tech debt activity you'd need versus yes there are context limits and it, it doesn't always perform but it's in the ID it's super easy it just works um, and then on that we did experiment code whisper alongside copilot for a while and we found it's only really good if you're writing Amazon code particularly Java and then Amazon services it's fantastic it definitely always gets you the latest interface version and all the other stuff but it, for almost all of our architecture, it actually had very, very poor results compared to Copilot, which is why we stuck with Copilot in the end and discontinued Code Whisper. In from our experience, on I I can jump to the other aspects of the dev process. Huge improvements for domain context or developers that are working on a problem set or QA to be able to ask questions around, say, an audit. What are the different stages of an audit? Tell me more about uh, risk and controls. And to be able to provide very nice, human understandable summaries of concepts that ideally you'd have a domain expert sitting next to them that would explain those. But in general enough terms, the developer has that aha moment to be able to understand a bit of the deeper context of why they're building what they're building and what it is. Lots and lots of positive feedback around leveraging that. And then Atlassian having it embedded in JIRA to be able to flesh out requirements or other aspects or summarize uh, has also been very useful for us. And then and all the other standard copilot use cases like Microsoft associated with the office and everything else is all great for the business. So okay. Um, last one, very cheeky. Um, it's a big question, but it's it's I think an interesting way to cl close it go close today's um, webinar is very briefly, you know, when you both think long term, where, where do you see the greatest potential for Gen AI and, and what do you think is holding us back currently? You know, what are the things that we need to change? Just real briefly back, sir, what's what's your view? What, what are you most excited about and, and, and what do you think we need to do to get there? So I think it's about getting much, much bigger context windows or RAG that is much easier to use uh, in order to be able to do it more intelligently mm -hmm. with a lower failure rate in order to create a meaningful level of accuracy in the output that it, it is the fastest way to be able to get rid of some of the long-standing technical debt through actually building up product features and stuff like that and personally i think it's probably about five years off but maybe i'm a pessimist maybe it's going to be a lot sooner than that but i feel like there's a bunch of hard computer science problems under the hood that if companies were able to solve it at the biggest scale like chat gpt they would have already and the fact that they're still working on that means by the time they get around to the more uh, specialized professional use cases, it'll probably be around the five-year mark, but we'll see. Um, but I think that's definitely where it's heading. But in the meantime, everyone definitely should be getting good at prompt engineering because this is the new Google search. As we all became experts at the Google search, our 
success and our team member success is going to be defined by our ability to be able to talk intelligently with easy AI programs, which is a generally transferable skill, regardless of the model that you're using and the interface that we're currently using today. So super excited around the brand new technology interface we all have uh, in general LLP application. Stuart, anything bring us home? What do you uh, want to talk about? So, so they're, they're very similar in that I think that the models are getting ever more powerful at a terrifying rate. Um, so, so if you'd asked me 18 months ago, it was an interesting research topic, but it didn't really do much all that useful. Um, you know, now we're at the stage where particularly RAG and the bigger models can get some pretty decent results. Hopefully the next generation starts to nudge us towards automation of those boilerplate and tech debt tasks. Mm -hmm. um, really the value for me there is that, that the more of that you can automate, you free up time to really focus on the, the kind of human creative task of, so, so what generates the most valuable capability for the customer, the, the best customer experience? You know, how, how do we really move the ball forward on, a, on the product rather than just the mechanics of the plumbing? How do I move a piece of data through the system and all, all that other stuff you need to do today? Excellent. All right, well, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time today. Um, thank you everyone for, uh, the questions for stick around with us. Um, we will post a video of this, uh, the recording on the on the website, and we'll send that around to folks. If you want to share it, please do. If you have any questions um, or any follow ups, please let me know. Um, but uh, for now, that's it. Thank you, Baxter, for the time today, and and Stuart, thank you very much as well. Appreciate it. Welcome. Thank you, everyone. Cheers.